Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop, here at chess.com. And I've been teaching chess to beginners and intermediate players since 1984. As you know, each Thursday we do a lesson. Um, and it can be an intermediate lesson or it can be a beginner's lesson. And we try to emphasize some meaningful uh, point of education. A point that maybe we struggle with. Maybe your coach struggles with himself. Maybe. <laughs> and see what we can learn from those games. And we've got a game from a long, long time ago between Ralph and Carl. And uh, Ralph actually lived across the street from me way back a long time ago. The lesson today is how we can tend to underestimate our opponent's resources when we have our own little um, attack going. And we're going to see that in this game. So we start with an English opening. E5 is the king's English variation. And with knight c3, we have a reversed Sicilian variation. And with knight f6, the two knights variation. G3 is the Carl's Bremen variation, which is funny. Because this guy's name is Carl S., and if you squish it together, it says Carl's. But the Carl's Bremen system. And here I will pause and ask you this question. And in this um, program, we invite you, the viewer, either on which TV? Or over here on Chess TV? <clears throat> we invite you to uh, give your input, your suggestions, your answers. The question I have for you is to what basic strategy does pawn to G3 point? What basic strategy does the Carl's Bremen system point to? That's right, Thibaut de Baker. Well, to control the long diagonal in general and the d5 square in particular. So, very good. Hey, bad rabbit. Yes, exactly. Of course, the d5 square being in the center is the most important square on that diagonal. Knight to c6. Now, knight to c6 is the reversed Sicilian closed. Black can also play the reversed dragon. And I'd like to address the audience again here and ask you to weigh in as to the pros and cons of the reversed dragon variation. What are the pros and cons of the reversed dragon variation? Shark says one of the Pros is to attack and control the center. Now, the key word in Harfty's answer is opens. It frees Black's game and permits a good development of his forces. It's more open. 
On the other hand, after pawn takes pawn, knight takes pawn, and bishop t uh, to g2, the power of the white king's bishop is enhanced. Whereas with the move that he played, the closed reverse Sicilian, um, Black has a somewhat cramped game, but the influence of this bishop is less pronounced. Hi, Gary Johnston McBain. <clears throat> and there's an important lesson right here. Both are book moves. You'll find both in the ECO. Both have their pros, both have their cons. We need to understand that with every chess move, we give up something to gain something. In this case, Black gave up mobility in exchange for stability. Now here, Black leaves the opening book. Does anybody happen to know the book move from this position? There are actually two book moves. The one I'm interested in then, I'll just give it to you. One is bishop to c5. But the one I'd like to discuss is bishop to b4. Now let's uh, discuss arguments in favor of following the ECO with this move. Give me some arguments in favor of following the book. Is this a good bishop? It's not that great of a bishop. Uh, the bishop doesn't have a, a promising future, let's say. And so it's worth Black's while, though it loses a tempo, frost fire, though it loses a tempo, it's worth his while to trade this bishop for this knight because this knight is a much better piece than the bishop in this set in this situation. In other words, removing a piece with promise such as the knight on c3 in exchange for a piece that doesn't have much of a future, even so it comes at the cost of an extra move, frostfire, it's worth it. And so that's the argument, one argument in favor of bishop to b4. Another argument in favor of bishop to b4 is that now that the white bishop has taken up its post on the fin kettle, d4 is no longer a move. And so black therefore, needs a recourse to d6, which on the given move will hem in his own bishop and make it an even worse bishop. So that's another argument in favor of the book move bishop to b4. Instead, Carl played bishop to e7. The doubling of the pawns is not as much of an issue. The bigger issue is more the potential energy of the knight compared to the potential energy of the bishop. Don't be afraid to double pawns necessarily. That's Yes, it creates a weak pawn, but it's not always so detrimental. You, you, the one good thing about doubling pawns is you're opening a file for your rook to work on. 
Doubled pawns can be a, a problem, especially if they're isolated. But don't put too much weight on the weakness of doubled pawns. All right, so knight to f3, kingside castles, kingside castles. Hello, Ed Bones. And pawn to d6. <clears throat> and since he can no longer play to d5, he restricts himself with this rather cramping move. Leaving his bishop, as mentioned a moment ago, with very little scope. In fact, at the moment, with zero scope. He cannot move at all at the moment. Now, you might wonder, well, why isn't d5 a viable option? I'm glad you asked. And maybe I should put that up to you guys. In fact, I will put it up to you guys. Why isn't d5 any longer a viable option? What would be the consequences of this move? If takes the knight is in danger? Well, I mean, he could just take. Right, but the main thing is this. You're losing a pawn. You are losing a pawn after pawn to d5. Because um, pawn takes pawn. Knight takes pawn. I'll take this pawn. And after knight takes, knight takes knight defended by the bishop if if instead of of knight takes knight here if knight takes c3 then knight takes c6 and after check takes B takes knight, white picks up the C-man with a tempo. Either way, white picks up a pawn at the end of it. So in short, pawn to d5 is no longer a viable move. Consequently, the bishop is infected with a severe case of tall pawn syndrome. Ogus Pogus greetings. Now, in contrast, preferable to pawn to d3 is pawn to d4 in for white. Now, why would that be preferable? I would like you to tell me. Let me go back to the alternative. Winroy wants to know. Let me go back to the previous alternate line. Winroy wants to know after knight takes knight, what if knight takes queen here? If knight takes queen, Winroy, white plays knight takes queen. And it's basically the same thing. It's just different. And in the end of this, white still emerges one pawn to the good. So I hope that answered your question, Winroy. Right now, in this situation, why would d4 be preferable? Yeah, he may have some compensation at Boon in the form of development. So, Harfty on the right trail here, it looks like. Harfty's saying 
that black is confronted with unpleasant options, basically. Um, if he plays e takes d4, if he plays e takes d4, Harfty says knight takes d4, and the pressure on the long diagonal becomes even stronger than it was before. And if black avoids the pawn trade, well, his position remains uncomfortably congested. So I think, Harfty, you nailed that right on the head. Well done. Give yourself a fist bump. Well, if he pushes the pawn to e4, we're going to super attack with knight to g5, which would probably necessitate pawn to d4, or excuse me, d5. And then after we capture, this is also less than desirable if captures. Now we take the knight, which comes under fire, and capture the e-man. And as you can see in this situation, white again emerges one pawn to the good. Bishop to d7. Now b3. I don't care for this move. Why did why did black play bishop to d7? What is black's plan? Why bishop to d7? What's he going to do? What do you always see in these kind of setups whether you're whether white is fiend kettled as in this case or black? That's right, Ed Bones. Carl is planning on queen to c8 to angle for a bishop trade on h3. And would that trade favor white or black? Uh, give yourself a thumbs up, Ed Bone. So this would favor black because his queen's bishop, light squared bishop, is far less effective than our light squared bishop, white's king's bishop. The whole point of this opening is to dominate, as we pointed on the very get-go, on the long diagonal in general, and d5 in particular. What would be a better choice than b3? In other words, how do we prevent bishop to h3? The way to prevent it, then, is to play pawn to h3. And if he insists on queen c8, king to h2, and everything's held together over here. So, Greyhound player, give yourself the A-OK. -okay. Is your A-OK -okay with me? Instead, Ralph played pawn to b3. All right, so queen to c8 is played. And bishop to g5. Now, why in the world did he play bishop to g5? What is the purpose? That's right, Greyhound player, you're on the ball. I'm glad someone is following my thinking. Yeah, remember, 
coming all the way back to the purpose of the Carl's Brayman variation to control the long diagonal in general, to control D5 in particular. And one of Black's controllers of D5 is this knight. And so White wants to obtain control, better control of D5, by removing this knight. The problem is that control is very temporary. And so this move is actually objectionable. On what grounds? What is the trouble, in other words, with bishop to g5? Because this control is only temporary. On a move like, that's right, D.A. Wood is right on the money. If the bishop is challenged by h6, well, you can't retreat here. So if you're going to retreat, you'd have to go this way, back the way you came. Or you're committed to this trade. But given the fact that your control is temporary, maybe the trade's not all that viable after all. So a very good DA Wood. DA Wood, give yourself the inverted knuckle crack like that. Oh, yeah. Well done. Well, needless to say, bishop to g5 was the move. Black continued with the expected bishop to h3. And white played bishop takes bishop. Why does he play bishop takes bishop? All right. He can't lose the tower. The tower's blocked. That's right, D.A. Wood, you are right again. There is no good reason. He has no good reason to play bishop takes bishop. Instead, he should have waited and made black capture. If black wants to trade bishops, make him do it. Very good furry-footed nerf herder. And that's a more efficient move, and, and it's much more preferable for white to go follow that course. Because in this line, the black queen gets right in your face, which would not be the case if you played something more productive, like on e3 or. Knight to d5 or rook to e c1. So, bishop takes h3 definitely gets a question mark from mate. Queen takes bishop. Bishop takes knight. Bishop takes bishop. And by the way, notice that White no longer has this beautiful diagonal. He does get knight to d5, which drives the bishop back to d8. And that brings a new question to the floor. How can black liberate himself from his cramped position. Bravo says, hey, let's just go for the immediate counterplay. And he will be ready in a few moves 
to go for this counterplay, um, bravo, when the time is right, when the circumstances are right. F5, and then you're going to follow that up with F4 or, or E4, depending on the situation. But E111, excuse me, E1111 says trade the, get rid of this strong knight. Trade the knight. And I'm assuming there's only one good way of doing it. So I'm going to pretend that you gave the move and believe that you were going to say, get the knight on e7. You play knight e7. And if he doesn't budge, then you play pawn to c6, and you make him budge. Very good, Eth. And uh, Eth, give yourself the drum roll fingers. And coming back to Bravo Charlo, Charlie Romeo. Yes. We do have ideas of eventually building something up here. Bad Rabbit gifting a sub to Mathemagical. Thank you, Bad Rabbit. I really appreciate that. All right, let's get back to the game. Queen to d2 by white. And sure enough, knight to e7. Ralph does not make him play c6. He just goes ahead and captures with check. Bishop takes d4. E4. And knight to G5. Now, I don't like knight to G5. How would black proceed? The better move by far would have been knight to e1. How would black proceed after knight to e1? We've already hinted at it, and Greyhound player is on the ball as usual. Good job, Greyhound player. Yeah, f5. Play f5. And after knight g2, rook f6. And after knight to f4, hitting the queen. You'll have to retreat the queen. And that's what black would have to do. But frankly, white now can just bring his rook over and he's fine. All right, but... um. Greyhound right on the money. Greyhound right on the money again. Greyhound, give yourself a wink and a smile. Oh, yeah. Well done. And, yeah, this would have been much better for white. Instead, he played knight to g5. And Black's response was queen to g4. Now, what do you guys think of queen to g4? I mean, this is a blunder because the knight is trapped. Ed Boone says, bye-bye knight. Eight chestnut eight says, does H4 protect the knight? No. No, H4 does not protect the knight.
and they and chestnut we'll get to your move in a moment all right um ed boone says white must take the pawn i'm gonna say this queen g4 is a blunder queen g4 is a blunder knight g5 was a blunder and queen g4 does not punish that blunder he needed to play queen to f5 in order to punish the blunder and we're about to show you why boom f4 Fair the well says does kb not understand that we're here we're just here to blunder that's our only purpose f4 saves the day Well, Frosted Chronicles, the point is that f4 interferes with the queen's defense of this pawn. And right, on h6, if he had played h6, if he had played h6, knight takes pawn. And he's just as safe as a baby in his beddy by snuggled in a blankie sucking on a binky now that's why queen f5 was necessary on queen f5 the pawn is defended and the knight is trapped which coming back now to um chestnut eight chestnut eight coming back to eight chestnut eight that's why h4 does not work h4 does not work because it does not interfere with the defense of the, the queen's defense of the pawn on h4 Well, the queen can still go to to uh, f5 here, but then we'll just pile up on it with queen e3. Now, lastly, and so that's why queen f5 is necessary. Queen f5 is necessary so that if I try to defend, it's there is no defense the knight is trapped f3 is hot h3 is hot etc frosted chronicles wants to know here whether pawn f3 works well the problem with pawn f3 is I can just take the knight for for free now. Frosted Chronicles. It's super attacked. And it's only defended by my queen. So it just becomes a free knight. So that's why you have to defend with the pawn. Defending with the pawn blocks the queen's defense of the e-pawn so that if he were to play h6 knight takes pawn one last consideration is what about pawn takes pawn on passant on this move the knight simply retreats so 
So hopefully we've covered all the lines and answered all the questions there. Black had to play Queen F5 to win the knight. Queen of G4 does not do it. And eight chestnut eight, hopefully you now see that the only thing that saves the knight here is pawn F5, as well as um, Frosted Chronicles. Hopefully you'll see that is true as well. All right, so he missed both... White blundered, black blundered. Pawn f5 saves the knight. Now, what about this move? Is black's chosen move a better move or? Is pawn takes pawn on passant better? And don't don't just say, yeah, that's better, or that's not better. Tell me why. Fair the well knight already on the board, uh, already uh, on the ball. Yeah, that turns the knight loose. It um gives the knight a square by weakening e6. So much better for black would have been. Pawn takes pawn on passant, forcing white to retreat his knight with the recapture. And then black can play something like rook to e8, creating pressure on the e-file, aiming at this backward e-man. By, cre by creating this weakness on e6, He's literally handing the initiative over to White. And White wastes no time occupying that square. So the rook defends c7 by moving to c8. Pawn to d5 cements the knight in its outpost. What a square for that knight. Bishop to f6. What a square for that bishop. Rook a to c1. So let's evaluate this, audience. Who has the better game? Black or white? And don't just throw out a color. Tell me why. If you think it's black, tell me why. If you think it's white, tell me why. Well, more to the problem, Greyhound player, is that C7 was under attack. And more than likely, the knight would have grabbed that up first to hit that and then maybe come back. Harfty points out that the black rooks are very passive. Big Tyke point, points out white has a very strong pawn structure. Real Dying of Thirst says, no, it's equal because E2 is backward. Well, I would suggest that white has the better game or the better potential because his pieces are more advantageously posted, particularly the knight. And all the positional advantages are in white's hands here. Black's pieces, as pointed out by Harfteam, are not cooperating with each other, and they don't have any real objectives. So based on that, white has the better chances, in my opinion.
But the question remains, and I want input on this as well. How should white proceed? What should his plan be in general? And what would, have, what would be a good way to begin executing that play? Fair the well says G2. Play king G2 and try to get the queen out of there. Zoo boat right on the money. That's what I was thinking is let's get some open lines for the rooks. Particularly, this rook is already lined up behind a moving pawn. And so let's open the door here for this rook. That, to me, would be a good plan for white, is to try to open up lines of attack because he already has pressure on this file. Understand here that this rook is already poised and ready for action. And so opening lines of attack where you already have pressure is a good plan. All right, black plays h5. What is black's plan, apparently? And what's the reason for his plan? That's right, he's trying to counterattack groundhog, groundhound, greyhound, <laughs> groundhog, greyhound player. He's trying to create a counterattack. He recognizes what we just said in the previous move, and he's trying to generate some counterattack to draw some of White's resources from the queen's side. And he needs to get his pieces in more effective positions. And so he's looking to counterattack here, get out of the way of his rooks, and attack over here where the queen is already exerting pressure. Now here, white did not appreciate black's threat. He played pawn e3. Well, the problem with king to g2 now is that the pawn comes to h4. We have to appreciate the purpose of this move to determine our best course of action if we're white. Now, I don't think this is necessarily a bad move on E3, but given Black's telegraphed plan, what would have been stronger than e3? In other words, anticipating pawn to h4, what should we play in order to answer pawn to h4? No, you don't want to push the h pawn. That will leave the g pawn undefended. Real dying of thirst suggests king f2. Edbone says, lift the rook. Dogbitten says, queen to e3.
Alright, I'm gonna suggest a very simple King to H1. Get out of the pin. King to H1. You don't want your king out here where it can be attacked. And the point now is if he plays h4, we can pawn takes pawn, and that opens the g file and gives us more opportunity to attack. Bam. The problem with king to f2 is you don't have that same opportunity because you're just dead. Coming back to whoever recommended king f2. So you got to put your king where it cannot be attacked. Boom. And now you've got a great attack coming on the G file. This looks really good for white. Instead, white played pawn to e3. All right, so h4 is played. <laughs> and it's ironic. It really is that now king h1 is played. Every level of chess, we see occasions where what was the best move here on the very next move is not the best move. Hey, Top Doc with $10 donation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's quite a, an irony. Now, this is not the best move because it sacrifices a pawn. Zuboat giving 100 cheer bits. Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much. He can still have a great game, or at least a solid game, without sacrificing any material. But sometimes our motivations as chess players are extremely illogical, such as refusing to play king to h1 when it could have been played without a sacrifice and playing it now when it involves giving up a pawn. But there was no need to give up any material if he would have played what move here? Queen to g2, Draxus. Exactly. Queen to g2 is completely satisfactory. And of course, if pawn takes, queen takes, queen takes, h takes, well, white still has his positional advantage. Now, objectively, as you can see from the eval bar, it's not an enormous advantage if you're a computer. But we're not computers. We're beginners and intermediate players and amateurs, club players at best. And this advantage for white is a lot bigger than the evaluation bar above my head would indicate. He is positionally superior. And that's something we need to learn as amateurs. Hey, Chef Was. That there's more than one kind of advantage. There's more than just material advantage. All right, so King H1 sacrifices a pawn. Queen f3 check, rook to g2, and all of a sudden black blunders. What should he have played instead of this pawn grab here? And this kind of illustrates the point I was just trying to make a moment ago. There's more than material advantage in chess that you must consider. And making an indiscriminate pawn grab can 
take an advantage and make it evaporate. Greyhound player really on fire tonight. We need to understand that pawn grabbing is not as important here as creating and maintaining pressure. And so, Greyhound player recommending King F7, and let's start applying some heat here. In fact, King F7 now would make white's pawn grab an ill-fated pawn grab. Because if he plays this, Rook H8 check, forces here, and then, well, Rook H3, and the Queen's Rook's coming in, and Black has a winning game. And this only emphasizes my earlier point about King H1 on move 21 instead of move 22. Essential on move 21, but out of place a single move later. Instead, Black grabs that pawn. And white grabs the pawn back. I'm going to teach you a valuable lesson. Maybe, and I've never seen the movie, but I know the quote. Maybe you've seen the movie Godfather. Have you seen it? There's a line in there, and I've not seen the movie, but I know the quote. There's a line in there that says, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. This pawn is no longer an enemy. He's a friend. Why is he a friend? Because he cannot be captured by his own forces, and therefore makes for a great hiding place for your king. By keeping this pawn close, you're keeping your king as safe as a baby in its beddy by, snuggled in a blankie, sucking on a binky. Oh, yeah. A very valuable lesson that you'll see many times in your chess career. Keep your friends close. Keep your enemies closer. Instead, well, I'll let you suggest a better move than capturing a pawn. That is not a free pawn. It's a very costly pawn. So the best move in this position is knight to d4. And if he takes, well, he's in hot water, isn't he? In fact, I don't see any way for black to stop queen takes g7 checkmate apart from giving up his own queen. On the other end, if he doesn't take, what else is there? What else is there? Because, let's say, I don't know what else he could play here. Let's say, Let's say he try he let's say he's gonna still try to activate his rooks. And he plays something like king here. Oh you can't, the queen's in danger. I was looking up here, but the queen's in danger. Hold on. 
The queen's in danger. You got to save your queen. So let's say he plays queen h here. Well, that doesn't work because then I'll just pick this off now. Now I'll pick it off because I have a target. There is no good for move for black. There's just no good move for black. Okay, queen h3, it's the same thing. Queen h3 is the same thing, Yankee. It's just different. It's the exact same thing. It's just different. We're still, now's the time to grab this pawn when it comes with an attack. So, knight to d4. Instead, white played king takes pawn, exposing his king. Now, do you remember what we were talking about a little while ago when we said white missed a golden opportunity on move 21 to play king h1? And how ironic it was that one move later, it was a mistake. Well, let's show that irony now again from Black's perspective. <laughs> King f7. Oh my goodness, what a mistake. Why is this a mistake, guys? Why? I'll give you a hint. What's the most important piece relationship that exists on this chessboard right now? What is the most important piece relationship? that exists on this chessboard right now. Most important peace relationship is the relationship between the black king and the black queen. And yes, Topologic Zero points out that the bishop is overloaded. The bishop cannot protect both g7 and g5. Good job, Topologic Zero. Therefore, Spider Piggies is right on target when he points out that rook takes pawn is decisive. We're going to look at that move in a moment. But first, let's ask the question, what was Black's best continuation instead of King F7? Pawn to G6. Ed Boone says, pawn to g6. That would leave the pawn undefended. Queen to h5, check. Forcing the king back. And now you can play king to f7. And, okay. Now you look for the repetition. Because... White's best bet here, because he has to avoid this. White has to attack on the h-file, but that allows the queen to go to g4 check. And because it's not his best bet to trade queens here, because that gives black initiative, he would have to allow the repetition. So, Chef Waz, you are correct. So, Chef Waz, you are correct. Instead, he played king to f7. More irony. What a beautiful move by Ralph. Bishop 
bishop takes, and of course, you have the fork. Now, what if, what if black had played instead of taking, well, he's only got one other legal move, and that's king to e8. Knight c7 still winning, I'm sure. I'm sure knight to c7 is still winning. But frankly, the best way... You guys, full credit for knight to c7. Because it's still winning. But you don't want to give your opponent even the slightest counterplay. And so the simplest and best way to avoid any counterplay from black is rook to h7. That keeps any kinds of checks out of there. It keeps the king frozen in, in place. The knight covering these squares. And the rook covering the seventh. And you've got ideas of checkmate coming real soon. What does, what does Black play here? He literally has no moves. He literally has zero moves here that he can play. Now, I'll give you guys credit for this because it's still got to be winning, right? If you play this, it's still got to be winning. But this just cripples black completely. No counterplay at all. All right. And there are a lot of ways to win. You could, frankly, play rook takes c7. You could leave the rook there and bring the other rook in. Frankly. But we just don't want to give our opponent even the slightest opportunity for counterplay. So bada bing, bada boom. All right. Well, he did take. The fork was played. The queen was won. Now we come to a very critical position. And it's critical for a number of reasons. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but if you've been watching this channel at any length, you know it has happened to me. You get in a position where you've just won some material, you've just gained an advantage, and there's this tendency to relax. There's this tendency to go into coasting mode. And when we do, we have this tendency to play casually. And we end up blundering it away. You've seen me do it on this channel. We must, first of all, understand that this psychological propensity exists, that we're all prone to it. And we therefore must be vigilant and careful to resist this propensity to become lackadaisical in such uh, positions of advantage. Because when we have such a large material advantage, how foolish do we look when it comes to nothing? And so for that reason, white needs to be particularly careful because notice, even though 
we have a queen and a rook for two rooks and a bishop. The door is now open for black. So white played rook to h1. What a mistake. I want to look at some alternate moves and discuss all of his alternatives. This guy also is a problem. This advanced F man. He doesn't look like much of a threat, but he's deep in enemy territory and he's controlling one of the royal squares. So let's look at some, some alternatives. Let's start with rook to g1. What would be the consequences of rook to g1? If you count strictly points, that's 5, that's 10, that's 15, that's 19. This is 9 and 10 and 15 and 20. So it's 20 to 19 if you count the points. It's not that far of a, it's not that uh, giant of a material advantage. But yeah, Zoo Boat and Yankee both coming up with Rook H8 check. This is hot, so that forces the king here. And now the other rook comes over, lining up with the king. And you you have to you cannot allow bishop to c3 check winning the queen. So you'd have to play queen to f2. Like, for example, you say, well, what about king takes pawn? No. That loses. That loses, and you've just lost your, your queen. You say, well, why not here? Because of this. Same thing. It's just different. So you can't play king a king um king to um takes pawn. And yeah, if you play queen to d3, you're still getting manhandled. Well, let's take this rook. And if he defends, then we have check. And if you try to keep the defense, it just keeps getting worse. Check. Check. And if you come... Well, these are all cut off. Come here. It's here, followed by check. It's all over. That's the point. Rook g1 doesn't work. Rook g1 doesn't work. All right, so rook g1, no. What about queen f2? Does that work? Yeah, you still play rook h8 check, exactly. Rook h8 check, king g3. Queen's rook to g8. In this case, 
White's going to be okay after king takes and king to e2. White's okay here. Queen f2 is playable. Let's look at rook f1. Rook f1. And rook f1, and we've let the cat out of the bag. Obviously, black is playing rook h8 no matter what. Rook f1, king g3, queen's rook to g8, king takes pawn, rook h3 check, king e2, and rook h2 check has no teeth. White is Jim Dandy here as well. So white should have played either rook to f1 or queen to f2. I think rook to f1 is a little bit better. Instead, he played rook to h1. He didn't take the necessary extra time. What about king to g1? On king to g1, you're still playing, in my opinion, rook to h8. Well, you might get away with this too, though, because your king is out of the immediate line of fire. I would think king to g1 is playable. The important thing is to not give your opponent any kind of initiative. So, Mumos, I think your, your move will work as well. But you cannot play king to f2. Excuse me, king to f2 and lose your queen. Keep that in mind. So get your queen out of that line of fire. Maybe queen to d3 would be a move. And this should be okay for white as well. But not rook to g1 and not rook to h1. Well, he played rook to g8, amazingly, missing the chance to equalize. Do you see the move that allows black to equalize here? And keep in mind, this pawn is critical. No, that's, um, the rook check is not going to do it in this case. King to G1. Chef was on fire. Bishop to C3. Bishop to C3 attacking the queen and saying, please take my bishop. And the point is this. If he takes the bishop, now you have check. And it doesn't really matter which way the king goes because the rook is the other rook is going to come in with check. Drive the king away from the defense of this rook. So it wouldn't have mattered if he was on g1 or g3. The king would still have to move to the f file. And now you have... Two rooks against a queen, which is very playable. Instead, Carl went with rook g8. And his idea is to move the bishop and confine the king. But he missed a golden opportunity.
All White has to do now is win the game. Basically, all he has to do is correct the error that he made on the previous move. But instead, Queen to F2. <laughs> Queen to F2. And that will leave White in a hopelessly lost position. He was winning. Now he's losing. So, I mean, obviously, his best bet was to just. So, his best bet was to just undo his mistake from the previous move. And we can see the similar ideas as before um, are not timely enough because white can get away and he's Hakuna Matata. Not possible. Not possible is um, queen to d3 in this example because bishop f6 right and you've got trouble lift and slide there's no good way to stop it apart from challenging the lifter, but then he slides over. The lifter becomes a shifter and gives check, and the king is forced to g3. And you have the same thing. It's just different. And now in this situation, sorry, we take this first. If you try to defend, then um, you have this check. And this rook is eventually going to fall. Mm. So queen d3 does not work. Rook f1 pretty much is the only thing that works. Well, let's see. What about rook g1? And we play rook h8, king to g3, queen's rook to g8. Um... Actually, if you play queen to f2, followed by a discovery, force this, rook h3 check, king e2, rook takes rook, queen takes rook, rook takes pawn, yeah. And then you just end up trading everything off, and you'd have a dead draw. So keep in mind, only only two moves ago, on move 29, White had a fairly direct win. But on the very next move, that win becomes very elusive. So elusive that after rook g8, he played queen f2 and ends up losing the game, what should have been a one game. All right, well, let's show... The rest of the game, bishop f6, queen takes the pawn. By the way, if he plays rook g1 here, you have the same problems as before. 
the the, the king comes to uh, the rook comes to h8 forcing the king to g3 only now you have this and that's lost So rook g1 isn't going to work. He took the pawn. He lifted the rook. And white saw that he has no way to continue without losing his queen. Doesn't matter whether he plays queen h5 or queen h3. The rook will win the queen. Defended by the bishop. And so, therefore, White resigned. Tremendous lesson. In terms of the high cost of underestimating your opponent. All right, I hope this was a help to you tonight. No, there's no more way to draw anymore because checkmate is being threatened. As soon as the rook comes here, it's checkmate. So you have to play either queen h3 or queen h5 to, to stop the checkmate. But then your queen is lost. Can't move the king. And you can't move the queen because it's pinned. You have to give up the queen for the rook. And that's that. This king is stuck here. And black will win this game.